Good afternoon and welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidate Forum for the City of Gainesville Special Election City Commission at Large Seat B. I am Deborah Scheiman, Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Alachua County. On behalf of the entire League, we welcome the candidates and the audience. We appreciate both your viewership and the participation of the candidates. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization which promotes democracy through voter education and advocacy. We do not endorse candidates or political parties, but for 100 years, we have studied and supported local, state, and national issues. I'd like to remind you that no recording in any medium is allowed. No part of this video may be used in a political advertisement. The content of the forum is the property of the League of Women Voters of Alachua County, which will record it and make it available to the public after this event. This forum is being live streamed to the League's Facebook page. Post forum viewing will be possible on the League's YouTube channel, as well as on our Facebook page. Those links will be also appearing on our webpage. I will be the moderator for today's panel. There are five candidates for the at-large B seat that will appear by name on the special election ballot. They are Cynthia Chestnut, Sherwin Henry, Matt Howland, Patrick Ingle, and Gabe Kamowitz. City of Gainesville seats are elected for a four-year term with a two-term limit. This special election is to fill the seat vacated by former commissioner, Gail Johnson, and so it will end in November of 2024. The seat on the ballot is elected by the city at large. So all registered voters residing within the city limits in Gainesville may cast a vote. League member Gwen Wagner will be asking the questions for the panel today. All candidates have received and agreed to the forum rules in advance. These are the standard rules used by our league for all of our forums. Mm -hmm. Questions were prepared and selected by members of the league. Candidates who appear on the city of Gainesville special election ballot by name have all been invited to the forum. Those that accepted our invitation are participants today. The views expressed in the forum are those of the candidates mm -hmm. and not of the league. The format of the forum will be as follows. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes for an opening statement. Following the opening statements, our question asker, Gwen, will read the questions prepared by the League of Women Voters. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer. There will be five questions total. Gwen will rotate the order in which the candidates respond then each candidate will have one and a half minutes for the closing statement. Candidates will be able to see the timers who will indicate the remaining time at one minute, 30 seconds and stop. Please stop when your time is up. If you do not, your microphone will be muted. No personal attacks, negative or disrespectful comments toward fellow candidates and or the league volunteers for the forum today are permitted. Failure to abide by professional conduct will result in immediate microphone muting. We will now begin with our opening candidate statements. Again, you have one and a half minutes each, and we will begin in alphabetical order by last name. And so we begin with Cynthia Chestnut. Your statement, please. Unmute. I decided to come out of retirement because the urgency of the dysfunction on the current Gainesville City Commission requires the experience, wisdom, leadership, humility, and respect of the public that I have developed as a veteran public servant for over 30 years. Furthermore, I feel indebted to the citizens of Gainesville who have elected and allowed me to serve at nearly every level of government. City Commission, 1987, Mayor, 1990, State Legislator, 1990 to 2000, and County Commission for one term. In 2007, Gainesville was recognized as the number one city in the U.S. to live by Money Magazine. 
but this city commission has us looking like a joke with this unnecessary dysfunction. The dysfunction, four of the six constitutional officers at the city quit. The mayor then asked a fifth to resign, he refused. And one, one officer decided to, to remain. A city commissioner resigned and now four out of the six commissioners that keep the city running have quit. We just went through an agenda of 54 pages, 54 pages for one night's meeting. We need more than new ideas and visions. I've got those, but what the Gainesville City Commission need, really needs, and I'm the only candidate to have, is a proven track record of delivering for Gainesville and an immediate ability to deliver as a member of the Gainesville City Commission. For example, I have uh, delivered uh, lottery money to fund Bright Future scholarships. Thank you. And thank you very much. Now we will move to Sherwin Henry's. Thank you very much. We will now move to Sherwin Henry's opening statement, please. Please unmute and start your camera. The Okay, there you are. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherwin Henry, candidate for Gainesville City Commission seat B. And I really uh, wanna thank you all for this forum today. I'm a former two-term Gainesville City Commissioner who's been active in this community for over 25 years. I served as a commissioner from 2006 to 2012. And quite frankly, I've never retired. I've been involved ever since I've been off the city commission. I served on the Eastside CRA advisory board for about six years. I'm currently a board member of NHDC Neighborhood Housing and Development. And I'm proud of our work and that we'll uh, actually open a senior living facility of 164 units uh, next year, 2022. And I'm running for the Gainesville City Commission to stop the madness that's going on. We have a lack of leadership. We have charter officers that are resigning. There's low employee morale. And I will be the steady, thoughtful, and experienced voice to bring wisdom and maturity to the Gainesville City Commission. This election to me is very important in that it really involves bringing policy forth that will affect the future of our city. And I am definitely confident that I am the commissioner that will be able to bring consensus among my colleagues and serve admirably to the people just as I did as the district one commissioner. And I look forward to sharing more about me during this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. And now we will ask Matt Howland for his statement, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking Dr. Chestnut and Mr. Henry. Uh, Dr. Chestnut has had a long, successful political career, and Mr. Henry has been a strong leader for East Gainesville. Uh, and personally, it really is a, an honor to be on the ballot with them. I'd also like to recognize the members of Gainesville Fire Rescue who joined me this morning to knock on doors and ask the residents of Gainesville to vote for me. It was an honor to walk with them as well. My name is Matt Howland. Uh, I offer a fresh face with sensible ideas. I'm a pragmatist. I solve problems by seeking education from subject matter experts. I speak with individuals who have an opinion opposite of my own. It's the only way I can make sure I'm not making decisions in a bubble. I was a public school teacher. I started a nonprofit organization. I worked in solar energy. I worked for the US Army. I worked for the city of Gainesville, Parks and Recreation, School Board of Alachua County. I worked in support of the Department of Defense. All my work is rooted in service. It's either in service to people or in service to the environment, and I'm proud of that. I'm running for city commission because I believe the city needs new blood. I think it's time we get back to basics. Local government has the greatest impact on our day-to-day -day lives. I don't have an agenda, and I'm not bringing ideologies to the commission. I just like good people with big hearts and big ideas. 
I've knocked on over 3,000 doors, and the more voters I speak with, the more I want to do this job. The only promises I'm willing to make are the things I can control, and that are my attitude and my effort. I promise to always be positive and optimistic and to carry myself in a manner that makes all of Gainesville proud. And I promise to work hard every day because I know, I know no one will match my energy or my focus. Thank you. Thank you, Matt Holland. And now we will ask Patrick Engel for his opening statement, please. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Patrick Engel. I'm running for the candidate for the city of Gainesville at large seat B position. I am the newcomer, the one without any political experience. But that doesn't matter in this election because this is where you start out when you want to enter public life, this type of position. What matters is you have to be a one that has a pure heart and a passion to serve the people. And be at the large seat, you need to serve all the residents of the city of Gainesville, not just a select few and not just a select and be able to listen to everyone issues in everybody's voice, not just a few select issues that you may have favorite. So, and I thank you for inviting me. All right, thank you, Patrick Engel. And now Gabe came with your statement, please. Are you ready for your opening statement, Gabe Kamowitz? Please unmute. There. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm seeking an at-large seat for the fourth time. I will run once more to oppose the next mayor in 2022. The fact that I can identify him and the winner of this election is not to suggest that I'm clairvoyant. Such predictability results from a lockstep approach by a single local party whose political blindness is not, <laughs> has not resulted in participation, but exclusion of Republicans, independents, college students, and military veterans like me. I'm ashamed to admit here that I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I take no oath and will not swear to support Democrats in a nonpartisan election. The rigid rules and predictable questions here further the dumbing down of democracy. There is only one issue in this special election, I think both commissioners, uh, former commissioners Chestnut and Henry addressed that, the turmoil in city government. Nothing else matters at this time. The only real question is what we candidates would do to try to change that environment in a city in which local law is flouted daily by your mayor and those commissioners who listen to gossip from employees instead of charter office. As a stranger in your strange land, I will conduct myself accordingly. I am a lawyer. Thank you, years. Mr. Kamowitz. Your time is up. We appreciate that. Thank you, candidates. I'm Gwen Wagner, and I'm a member of the Voter Services Interest Group. We will now move on to our prepared questions. You will have two minutes to answer each question. 
Candidates will receive a one minute and a 30 second reminder from our timekeepers. Please be advised that if you go over the time limit, your mic will be muted. We will start with the second candidate alphabetically and then rotate the order in which candidates will respond to the questions. For our first question, we will begin with Sherwin Henry. What solutions do you have to facilitate effective communication and foster constructive relationships among city commissioners, citizens, county commissioners, and surrounding municipalities? Okay, um, should I hit my video or are you gonna do it for me? Okay, great. Hi, uh, what I will do is first of all, I will come to the city commission as a person of integrity, character, and a willingness to work with others. Um, as I stated before, I am a two-term Gainesville City Commission, former city commissioner, District 1, and I am able to build consensus. And when I served, I built consensus both among my colleagues on the city commission, as well as the county commission. And as for me, when it comes to the citizens, I realized something that the present commission doesn't realize, that I work to serve them, not the citizens serving me. I am there commissioner, their employee. And what I will do, first of all, is listen to them, not tell them what I want to do, but I'm going to listen to them to meet their needs and to make sure that whatever concerns they have, either in their neighborhood or in this community, that I will be in a position to carry out those concerns as well. Um, secondly, what I will do is bring about sound policy that could be implemented to make a difference for all the citizens in our city. Gainesville must be a city of inclusiveness and diversity. And we must bring about opportunities for families to grow themselves economically, housing as well. And that is what I will do as the next at-large seat be commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Howland, your response, please. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the moderators for working through the technical hiccups. I really appreciate that. I think it really comes down to the people that we elect. That's number one. So as a former teacher, a nonprofit founder, I was in the community every day building consensus and relationships I'm confident with my ability to work with all the current elected officials. If the voters have questions about my ability to work with the current elected officials, I encourage the voters to contact their elected official and ask them. The, there's other things we can do to improve communication and workflow. I've talked about this before with the charter officers between uh, six commissioners and a mayor and six charter officers. That's 42 different angles of communication. That's different silos of work. This can make communication and workflow difficult. Uh, the, I think there are also opportunities to, if we're going to examine uh, possibly eliminating some or removing some charter officer positions, that we could also consider adding staff support to the city commission to allow the commissioners to have more time to be out in the community doing the work that they're elected to do, which is listen to the voters. I can tell you that with all the doors I've knocked on so far, one of the things I hear most, aside from just the issues, is a feeling that they're not listened to, that they haven't seen their commissioner in a, in a while, and that they feel like their voice isn't valued in City Hall. This is something we can rectify, but we have to provide the commissioners a little bit more support to get out in the community and listen to their voters. So those are some things that we can work on. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Ingle, your response, please. Okay. Okay, just do it. Okay. Yeah. As as I said at the start of my campaign, I bring my empathy and my humility to the to the commission to the commission to this campaign, as well as my experience 
in conflict re resolution and team building that I acquired from my years of corporate work throughout the decades. This is what is needed to first to bring the chaos, remove the chaos and bring order to the chaos in the commission. And so we can get back down to governing. And also to remind my fellow commissioners that for the reason why they pursued that position, why they pursue public office, so they don't get distracted by the day-to-day -day events of other issues. That the purpose is to serve the people and to listen. And that's the first. Then we can concentrate on further governing and benefiting the people and the residents of Gainesville. Thank you. Thank you. Gabe Kamowitz, your response, please. Can you hear me? Oh. Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. My response is as a attorney and as a investigative journalist, the city is structured in a way that the current commission and the candidates so far are ignoring. And that is their is the city is supposed to be run since 1923 by charter officers. They could, elected officials can only speak to them. That's constantly ignored. It's a misdemeanor in this city for them to talk to employees. They want to do that, they do that, and they totally flout the structure of the government. As a result, our mayor has resulted as being a strong mayor, not his fault. But the point is, our government has been so diffused because no one understands what the legal structure is for it. We can't talk in that kind of chaos. The reason for this chaos is because all of the commission and charter officers have been bubbling along without understanding a clue how we operate. Finally, I would point out there was a workshop in 2015 to try to resolve this issue. It was unresolvable. Commissioners still want to talk to employees. What's happened is gossip of employees have totally altered the charter office structure. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's my <laughs> I thought you were finished. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should be clear. Cynthia Chestnut, your response, please. Okay, would you just repeat the question again in this entire? Yes. What Thank solutions you. do you have to facilitate effective communication and foster constructive relationships among city commissioners, citizens, county commissioners, and surrounding municipalities? Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, let's address citizens. I think the city commission needs to return to citizen engagement so that citizens feel welcome to come to the commission to address their issues. And you can do that by taking meetings out into the community on the citizens turf. Town hall meetings. Each of the commissioners uh, prior to Zoom were having uh, individual time, town hall meetings. But I found when I was on the county commission, one method that was very effective was for the whole commission to go into the neighboring uh, uh, cities and meet with people as a group so that you're hearing the same thing and you can then take some policy direction from people. Um, I. I want to uh, uh, build a team with our employees. I think that employees feel left out of the loop. The city does a lot of things for, uh, they offer a lot of things individually, but I think building a team, perhaps um, an annual picnic, an annual family day, but more, more involvement. I also, I, I just remember uh, when I, well, prior to serving on the city commission, uh, a local group and I uh, wanted to get a park, wanted to get uh, tennis courts on Northeast 16th Avenue. Our group was focused and Dr. Leela Pratt took the leadership, but we wrote to our city, asked for the uh, tennis court in our area 
because we didn't have it at that time. And the city responded. They responded because they were listening to the citizens. They had the citizen involvement. Many of the citizen advisory boards have been eliminated. Citizens have no opportunity for input to the city. So that would be my first thing. Town hall meetings, Zoom meetings, and um, uh, uh, increased citizen involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Now we move on to the next question, and we'll start with Matt Howland. Gainesville City Commissioners have set environmental goals, such as the Zero Waste Initiative and 100% Renewable Energy by 2045. What is your position on these goals? Great, uh, fully support them, that's easy. So let's talk about some of these goals. Uh, I worked in solar energy, so clearly I'm very passionate about solar energy, um, but I'd like to address some of these things one at a time. The, uh, the zero waste initiative, I think that's great. It also made my wife very excited. Uh, and I, something like zero waste, that's a noble and sensible pursuit. I think the two most important components of the zero waste campaign is the reduction of food waste by connecting the surplus with areas of need. But I also think the education around the composting uh, solutions is very important as well. This zero waste campaign is something where it's very easy for the, the residents to buy in and start working towards this on day one. Uh, and, and so that's great. I also think that there's an opportunity with the zero waste to um, increase uh, food equity uh, and this idea of, of mobile markets that I've seen work in other cities, this idea that we can take the food into other communities. Renewable energy, let's talk about that for a minute. So we have the biomass plant. We've invested a lot of money to make it work for us. It's working for us now. That doesn't have to slow, our, slow us down from pursuing solar energy. Uh, the, like I said before, I'm a big advocate of solar energy. Solar energy is one of the top priorities of my campaign. Uh, but there are some things we need to be aware of as we drive forward with solar energy. One, if it's private rooftop solar energy where residents get to put rooftop solar, that, that's great, but every time that a resident puts rooftop solar on, it could create increased uh, uh, pressure on other residents with GRU utility rates. I think we have to consider opportunities for GRU to be the owner of large solar, uh, and, and there have been opportunities for us to pursue that, and I think we need to keep pursuing that, and GRU has been a good partner in that direction when it comes to having GRU own solar. Uh, and then there's some other things that we all support as a community wild spaces, public places, uh, we need to keep funding that. Uh, and then we need to make sure also that the conversation around development, infill development and uh, having less- Thank uh, you, Mr. Howland. Okay. Understood, thank you very much. Patrick Ingle, your response, please. Okay, yeah. I'm very much for re um, renewable energy and zero waste. As a former New York restaurant owner, um, food waste was top of my criteria to try to avoid, which is and which is good to put the food waste or the excess food that's still edible to other sources, food that's not edible into a community composting project. But not we don't stop there. We also need to improve our recycling, as well as taking the plastics and doing reuse for plastics, maybe into building materials. So we have a lumber shortage, um, look into turning the plastics into, re into building materials. And in order to achieve zero waste, we have to step up our recycling on it. And as for renewable energy, as long as we do not affect, adversely affect the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Gabe Kamowitz, your response, please. Hello? You need to turn on your, your mic and your picture. I'm having trouble. Hear me. There you are. OK. Um, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. What is not being considered, I suggest, is the fact that this is a city of very diverse neighborhoods. 
And this is a city with terribly different income levels. What am I getting at? Solar energy is nice to talk about, but you can't have it in many neighborhoods where the funding isn't there or the personal household income isn't there. The same thing goes with even waste. The issue of waste is different. In Duck Pond, I suggest, than it is in the Porter's community. The issues are different in each community. It's unfortunate. And not many cities are as divided as we are. In 2011, we were ranked fifth in the nation in disparity in income. When Money Magazine backed the city as number one place to live at, you had to consider the source, okay? It's a magazine for rich people. And that makes a difference. This city is very livable for people like me, a retiree with income, et cetera. But if you're poor, you can't meet those standards. What that means is we have all kinds of cockeyed policies that don't work. For example, talking about the biomass plant, it was a failure economically because what was not anticipated was that natural gas prices would remain low. And therefore we're paying a fortune that we shouldn't be. Also the elephant in the room is critical. Who is the elephant? The elephant is clear, the University of Florida. You can't breathe on issues of renewable energy or even waste without knowing what direction the University of Florida is taking and has been taking and will take. I'm done, thank you again. Thank you. Cynthia Chestnut, your response, please. Thank you. Um, I support the uh, Zero Waste uh, Committee and their work. I think it's come to an end, but uh, I was particularly interested in the food diversion because my church, Mount Pleasant United Methodist, participates in that. We have a food harvest. Uh, once a week, and we are able to get food that is diverted from the local grocery stores, bakeries, what have you. That is one. I think we need to look at and address food deserts and composting inaccessibility in the community. We need to, I think, work or establish a committee on energy justice. It is quite well known that uh, poor people uh, in disenfranchised neighborhoods tend to use energy, tend to have higher utility bills because of the way that they utilize uh, their energy, energy in their homes. So the city, and I think we need to begin to address policies that we can begin to help in reducing uh, the uh, utilization there in terms of helping to guide them into uh, uh, better, better utility use. The Biden administration would like to see 40% of the federal clim climate monies go to teaching people how to become more, much more energy efficient. And I think that's something that we need to work on and it's something that I would be dedicated to. And I support the city's goal in working towards um, uh, their, energy, their, their energy goal. Thank you for 2035. Thank you. Sherwin Henry, your response, please. Well, first of all, um, as everyone has said, I mean, it makes uh, sense to pursue uh, zero waste, but let's face the reality, it is a goal and that's what it is. But let's look at it. There are three phases to achieving this. You have home, you have business, you have community. At home, as has been said about composting, that's going to be a great education component. Businesses such as supermarkets, it's great that we are talking to them about doing something with the excess food that's left over that could be utilized by families and others. And then the community as a whole, like you have your dry cleaners and so forth, you need to make sure that they are able to dispose of their waste uh, safely. Now, when it comes to the energy, um, solar power is good, but at the same time, it will put downward pressure on GRU as far as revenue. And again, 
I like what GRU has done with our energy uh, diversification. We do have the biomass. We do have some degree of solar. But at the same time, I like what they've done with Deer Haven and that it's become a cold generation plant as well. And um, so what we have to do really is begin to invest out in the community. For instance, some of the federal dollars that we got I didn't hear the city commission talk about maybe setting some of that aside so we could go out in the community and help people upgrade their homes uh, energy-wise as well. And so it's going to take a concerted effort, but education is the key and investment is the key to solving these issues. Thank you. Thank you. For our third question, we will begin with Patrick Engel. Please identify three of the most pressing issues for the city commission and describe how you would address them. Okay. The first, the first pressing issue for the city commission is affordable housing. And I've been addressing that is to introduce or bring more affordable housing initiatives. Currently, they just released a, their new, latest update to housing uh, initiative, and they have an open forum on October 28th, which is, I'm very much in support of that. And I invite the community to participate in that open discussion on the 28th. Um, I, to my view, my initiative to bring affordable housing is to work with the landlords and developers to in a volunteer basis first before any mandates of any type of rent control. The second issue is the transportation. We are governed, we are being a local community, a local government, we are still mandated and to abide by both state and federal um, guidelines, which includes the Florida Department of Transportation. Complete streets is a good idea, but it has to be implemented at the state level and adopted by the Florida Department for transportation for what we can implement fully in Gainesville. The um, pedestrian overpass and the crosswalks, diagonal crosswalks, are in the Florida Department of Transportation of um, Gaines, Florida Department of Tra Transportation guidelines. And the third issue is getting our retail and restaurant workers back to work where they can feel safe satisfied knowing that they have a career and a future. And that's why I bring into making them a protected class from violence, as well as introduce a fund for retirement and we restaurant worker and retail workers. Thank you, your time is up. Thank you. Okay. Gail Kim, please proceed. Thank you. Okay, am I heard yet? Am I on yet? Turn your video on too, please. I'm sorry? Your video, your picture I, is not showing. I keep trying to do that, I'm sorry. It won't <laughs> oh, it almost went on. It's not going on. All right. There you are. All right, sorry to be a technical, <laughs> technical wizard. Uh, the three issues come down to ignoring three different populations that are critical to running this city. Elections are held every year since I've been here since 1992 by exclusion of students. They don't count. Issues around students are irrelevant. Today, for example, there is an issue of UF graduate students at apartment, apartments can be saved. University has decreed this one popular area is going to be eliminated because the housing is faded. The next group are military veterans like me. We're excluded because many of us have hearing difficulties. And for example, the city commission to this day remains a problem for each individual who attends with a hearing disability. Further, there are veterans in 
wheelchairs. Nothing is done to encourage veterans to participate. Then we get to the realistic makeup. And I don't want this to be personal, but the fact is that all city commissioners are loyal to the Democratic Party by oath. All county commissioners are loyal to the Democratic Party by oath. All Board of Education commissioners until DeSantis exercised the Republican op uh, option are Democrats and that's it. You're one party when your candidates talk about citizens, they're talking about their constituents. Their constituencies are very narrow. We can't have citizen participation as such. Yes, you can have special interest groups as one of the candidates suggested. So my issues, three issues are really clear. Involve students, involve veterans, involve other political views. Thank you very much. I'm Cynthia Chestnut, your response, please. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, uh, one of the most pressing issues facing the city now is what is neighborhood preservation? We, if you look at and follow what's happening, for example, with the Suburban Heights neighborhood, where the uh, city is considering allowing density there uh, with a six story building where uh, St. Michael was formerly housed, a six story building with 220 units in it, um, I is, 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 is really infiltrating and, and uh, it's just shameful to, to what to that neighborhood. So maybe the city commission needs to sit down again and define terms. Density, where should density go? I think density downtown, infill downtown, but not in single family neighborhoods. What is a single family neighborhood? Go back and review accessory dwellings, which they approved uh, in the still of the night. <clears throat> go back there and look at, uh, get a report whether or not that, that change, which was passed in uh, 2020, has been effective, moving on. What is affordable housing? Is affordable housing someone who makes $30,000 a year or someone who makes $8,000 a year? Many of the developers now are, are, are being allowed uh, higher heights when they say that they're going to affordable housing. I think it, it is really a ruse I want to know how long that affordable housing will be in place. Um, I think that um, the uh, I think we also need to stop the gentrification of traditionally black neighborhoods. City needs to come to an agree an agreement there as to Thank what. Thank you. Your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. Sherwin Henry, your response, please. Thank you. Well, I have a number. Okay, let's start with the budget. Um, Gainesville has been quite comfortable in not seeking out new revenue streams, having the university here, Santa Fe College, as well as Shands, North Florida as well. And so the city commission almost has uh, begun to realize since they are now taking um, eight years and decreasing the general fund transfer by $2 million, but that's not enough. So our budget really is primarily what we need to begin to look at in creating new revenue streams. One of the solutions that we can start uh, by doing that is encouraging small and medium-sized business development. We also have a GCRA, both the county and city contributed $70 million to that fund to go into the economically deprived communities to foster economic development. For years, I've talked about uh, intercity redevelopment, our downtown East Gainesville as well. Um, I'm glad to hear other candidates talking about that, but I've been talking about that for years. Housing, 
We need to create a housing trust so that we can get a handle on affordable housing, but also partner with those as well that are involved in affordable housing. And secondly, small homes for the homeless and veterans. We have Grace Marketplace that can be a partner in bringing that about. Those are my priorities. I don't know about anybody else, but that those are things I've been advocating for the longest. And that's what I will begin to do once I'm elected the at-large seat be city commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Howland, your response, please. Thank you. Uh, I love this question because it really gets to the heart of where uh, of what each candidate is focusing on. Uh, and I have three things I'd like to talk about. I think pressing issues are issues that affect the whole community, right? So we're talking rate increases, complete streets, and our first responders and public servants. And here's what I mean. One, I think we got to get better, stronger prioritization of spending at City Hall. We have to do more to protect against the rate increases. When you knock on the doors, when you go out into the community and you talk to these voters and they are fixed income residents, they are having a hard time with the rate increases. Now, I understand that the cost of energy production always goes up. I get it. But there are things we can do to buffer against rate increases or deliver support to our fixed income residents who need support the most. That's number one. Number two, complete streets. We are making great progress with this, and it makes me very excited. Uh, I love the progress and the proposed plans for University Ave and 13th Street. I think we can do more. I think we can do more on Southwest 2nd Avenue. Uh, but I want to touch on first responders and public servants real quick. So our first responders have worked for us all throughout the pandemic. Well, we need to make sure that our fire and police forces have the resources they need to recruit and retain diverse candidates. We need to invest in alternative policing and non-jailable offenses so that police officers can focus on actual police work. Uh, and there's a little bit here that's outside of the scope of the city commission, but I would also encourage the school board to take care of their teachers. And I would put pressure on U.S. Shands to make sure that, need, that their nurses are taken care of. These are the, the first responders and public servants that have gotten our back all throughout the pandemic. They got our back uh, and I intend to get theirs. Thank you. Thank you. This question starts with Gabe Kamowitz. What is your understanding of the role of the city commissioners in the daily operation of local government and services? Unmute yourself, please. I'm trying to do that. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that gets to the heart of the issue that I have raised, that this is not a subjective issue, which is how the question is being phrased. There is a government structure that is being ignored, and that's very critical. Once that is ignored, it's hard for anyone to give you an answer because the chaos here is not the fault of any individual. It's each commissioner and each charter officer trying to do their job individually. There is no coherent structure. The law is in place, the law was followed, and then somewhere around the voter discretion to make the mayor's office an elected office. And that was done by a referendum. Since there has been an elected mayor, which is the law, the structure of the government has gone out of whack because the city manager's role has constantly been overshadowed. We had, from my perspective, a step by a city manager who just resigned, who was literally a step and fetch. He didn't mean to be. He meant to serve the community. He couldn't. Mayor Polk has taken over the big screen. And that's, I don't want to name names. This is not an issue. I'm not attacking Mayor Poe in any way. I'm saying this is the flaw of the fact that we have to go back to looking at what's on paper, what our charter says, what our ordinance says. This election is unlawful because there is no legal support for it. There was support for the elections of 2018, 19, and 20 to be run by the city. Right now, we don't know whether the city or the state is supposed to be running this election. We're running for seats, seat B 
That means it's a city. But the last time we I ran, I ran for C2, which was a state one. It should have been a city designation. This is chaos. As long as you have chaos, Thank you. you can't. Your time is up. Thank you. Cynthia Chestnut, your response, please. Okay. All right. I was trying to start the video. Um, the charter clearly states that the city commission is responsible for hiring the charter officers. The city manager and officers are responsible for the day to day operation of their shop. I think that we've seen a, a, a sort of fudging of, this, of the lines there. But the professional manager, is, that is who we look to for accountability in carrying out a uh, role and scope and the duties and the budget for the state government. Um, I think that we need to maintain a professional manager because then the professional manager is not subject we hope to the political whims of the commission, but the commission is not to interfere in the day-to-day -day operations, nor are they to reach down into um, uh, uh, individual departments. And that is left to um, the city, that's left to the GRU manager, it's left to the auditor. They are to run their own departments. And that is why I do not support uh, a mayor form of government. I, I support the commission uh, manager type of form of government because you much more accountability there and it, uh, much more creativity and it's not subject to the political whims. And this is something that we addressed when we had the Charter Review Commission that was able to serve on that we wanted to definitely keep the separation separation of jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Sherwin Henry, your response, please. Okay. okay, it's telling me the video stopped. I'm trying to click on. Okay, thank you. There you are. You're All on. Right. Okay, so this goes back to the culture of city hall that the roles are out of whack we have a city commission city manager form of government and the city manager is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations handling the budget and so forth but the but the city commission hires the charter officers and the charter officers answer to the city commission and so um, for me, what we've had are various city commissions that have really, in some instances, either acquiesced their authority to the charter officers or have not given clear direction as to what they wanted the charter officers to do in moving the city forward and also responding to the desires of the citizens as well. But the one thing um, that's in place is that number one, the commission can fire charter officers, but number two, the citizens can fire city commissioners by voting them out of office. But what we need to do is have a city commission that comes to the realization as to what their role is and actually carry out that role to change the culture that is now in place. So that, that's my response. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Howland, your response, please. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I received the support of uh, former Democratic County Commissioner Hutch Hutchinson. And, and when asked, why do you like Matt? He said, I like the fact that he's a straight talker. So here's a little bit of straight talk. The local government should be really great at the boring stuff, and that's okay. 
That's utilities, waste collection, street repair, street design, managing city employees, capital investment at fire stations and police departments, preservation of beautiful parks and green space. This is where the focus of the city commission should be every day. Second, hiring of charter officers. And that's something that's going to come up this year and next year. I wanna start by commending the commission with the appointment of Cynthia Curry. I think that's an incredible first step uh, in, in the appointment of charter officers that are committed to pragmatic and sensible solutions. And also how we approach the hiring of charter officers in the future will also play a major role in the diversity and inclusion of our city. So it's important that we keep our eyes on that. Now, this goes back to the original point of my opening statement. Uh, we need to be very careful that we are not electing officials that are coming in with agendas or ideologies, right? There's no room or space for politically convenient answers. They are unproductive. We shouldn't make absurd promises or guarantees to the voters. We should be very pragmatic in our approach. And so we need commissioners who are willing to talk about the nuance, talk about the gray areas, and be willing to talk about the hard stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Patrick Ingle, your response, please. Yes, the role of the city commissioners um, of is legislature's role. In Mississippi code, um, specifically prohibits the city commissioners to instruct or govern other than inquiry only of the city of the charter officers, which includes city manager. The city commissioners, we are the legislative body of the city. The city managers, the city the charter officers, they actually run the day to day operations. And our responsibility is to inquiry and ensure, inquire to ensure that they are following the guidelines set down in the charter and the code and referendums. So, and that's how we get back. And my part would be ensure that the fellow commissioners are in fact only inquiring on the charter officers and not instructing the charter officers. They're not going over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Our final question starts with Cynthia Chestnut. Should the Gainesville City Commission change to a strong mayor form of government? Why or why not? All right. Uh, I do not support a strong mayor form of government. Uh, for many of the reasons that that I've already uh, stated, um, one is that I I prefer the professional manager that is trained, has the job experience, and has the portfolio to really to manage a city. I don't think uh, in electing a strong mayor, we're looking to the political whims of what may happen or may occur. I believe in the uh, commissioner manager of government. I think that that is much more effective. It should be much, it should be closer to the people and it should be uh, one where citizens uh, have more involvement. Not the case exactly here, but um, uh, Tallahassee has what they call a leadership form of uh, leadership mayor. It is very similar to what we have now. And that person is responsible for uh, 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 ceremonial duties or uh, handling civil proceedings, but they are not responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the city. I think that when you have a, a city commission, a mayor, where the mayor rotates, it uh, offers the opportunity for all of the commissioners to be involved in the policy making or, uh, or to have a voice. And so a um, strong mayor, I think, is not where Gainesville wants to go. We have we had the opportunity to look at this type of government before uh, some years ago when we had an elected school superintendent and we decided the voters decided to change to a professional manager a professional person that is where you want to that is where where we want to be with the professional manager 
a mayor that is much more ceremonial than uh, take the day-to-day -day operations of the government. That is not the type of we want in our community. Thank you. Sherwin Henry, your response, please. Okay. I am not in, for, in, in favor of a strong mayor, and I'll tell you why. Um, to me, the governing body should be representative of its people. That's number one. Um, during our um, the uh, commencing of the Charter Review Commission, we did have a commissioner that came in and was trying to plant seed about looking at um, altering the charter to possibly um, input the legislation to have a strong mayor, but the group decided not to do that. And because I really feel that the governing body should be accountable to the people as well. Now you have some that say, well, people that are serving on the city commission, they might not have the professional skills, but that's why we have the city manager. That's why we have the auditor. That's why we have the general manager of the utility. That's why we have the clerk. That's why we have the EO charter officer because they possess the skills to do that. But to me, government should be a government of the people by the people. And what we do is we hire those that have the skill that's needed to take the city into the future, the day-to-day -day operations and so forth. So that's my stance, no, no strong mayor because special interests are involved in the elections now. Just think if we talk about going to a strong mayor, the possibility of pandering taking place to the special interest groups. No, uh, let things stay like it is and clean up the culture uh, at City Hall and let's move this city forward. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Howland, your response, please. All right, uh, short answer. I don't even need all my time, Gwen. You can ask some of it back. No, do not support. <laughs> I understand the spirit and intent of having a strong mayor, right? With a strong mayor, the voters have someone to look to for strong leadership and if uh, potentially someone to hold accountable if things don't go according to plan. I get it. We love the idea of a strong mayor when we love the mayor. But like uh, Mr. Henry just said, what happens if we have a mayor that perhaps doesn't always serve in our best interest, but they're a strong mayor? There, there's a reason why the commission has balance and there's a reason why we empower the city manager. It creates this level balance across the commission and the local government. I am not in favor of a strong mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Engel, your response, please. Okay. At first, I was actually for a strong mayor, but I'm more for a strong leadership and accountable leadership. If, if a strong mayor does, in, does affect the daily operations of the charter officers, then I'm against the strong mayor whether it's a leadership mayor or a rotating mayor. I say, let it bring it to the people and let them vote on it. But we need to keep maintain balance and our checks and balances and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Gabe Kamowitz, okay. your response, right, you. please, and turn on your video. I will do the best I can to try to do that. I seem to have trouble. We've got you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we're talking. We're talking. I, I, the only way I can describe it is nonsense. Okay. I lived under a strong mayor. I know what that is. It's a formal structure of government in Orlando in which the mayor has the only power to introduce any legislation. Every commission has to come through the mayor. The administrators like the city manager, et cetera, are exactly that. This city hasn't got a strong mayor. It can't have a rotating mayor, I hate to say, because the voters chose not to do that. They voted to have an elected mayor. Now, with regard to a strong mayor, I am saying to you, that your next mayor from 2023 on will lead to a fascist form of government 
like Gainesville has never seen and the people will be happy with. And the reason for that is that that individual has built the city commission to his liking, okay? We know he will have a majority, a four member majority, that's all he needs. And at that point, you can forget what the rules are, you can forget what the laws are. This community will be run by two powerful foundations and will be run by a mayor who serves the interest of those two powerful foundations. I'm finished, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of the candidates. At this time, I'll hand the forum back to Deb, who will invite candidates to give their closing statements and provide some final reminders. Thank you, Gwen. All right, it is now time. Thank you, candidates and audience. But before we do that, we're going to have our closing statements. And each candidate will have one and a half minutes. We will hear the candidates' closing statements in the reverse order from the opening statements. And so we will begin with Gabe Kamowitz. You have one and a half minutes. Please unmute and start your Can you video. Hear? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I, I don't know whether you can see me, but. Can't see you though, if you could start your video. I'm trying to do that and I see, oh, okay. We there you go, out. we got Thank you. you so much. Okay, the Florida League of Women Voters in 2020 supported Black Lives Matter movement. I agree with that decision. I do not consider it political. I therefore have a strange closing remark. I'm a stranger in your strange land. And as far as I'm concerned in the modern world, we have to recognize the development and needs of a population that has been ignored for, cent for centuries, literally. I live in what I believe to be a Jim Crow town. What am I saying? I'm a white man running for office. There are two other whites. I don't want you to vote for any of us. I want you to vote for either Cynthia Chestnut or Sherwin Henry. My preference is for Sherwin Henry, who I backed the last time. It is critical that this seat be maintained by an African-American who can be elected at large. I think Cynthia can do that, but the problem with that is she does that as a unique individual, not as a black, et cetera. So my suggestion strongly is to support Henry, get out the vote from Henry and put him back in office. The idea of the visibility of who's on that commission at the moment is critical. I'm glad we have a city manager who is African-American, but I suggest contrary to this, sir, um, Howland, that in fact, she is a dangerous problem. Okay. You can't find anything out. Gabe Kamowitz, your time is up. Thank you very much. And now we will move on. We will move on to Patrick Engel, your closing statement, please. As I have said and started my campaign, I am the one without experience. I am a newcomer. And as I keep repeating, you don't need the experience. You just need the passion and a pure heart to, that you want to serve the people and the residents of Gainesville. Because this is what preserves our democracies, that anyone like me, like you, can enter a local race and have, and have a chance and opportunity to succeed and bring good values, good leadership, good, good I, new ideas to your local government. So preserve the democracy and ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And Matt Howland, you'll be next for your statement, please. Thank you. Uh, I wanna thank Dr. Chestnut and Mr. Henry for bringing their experience and civility to this election. New ideas come from new people 
and the many challenges that our city face are related to the future. We're trying to ensure Gainesville is resilient for the future and the challenges we face are related to technology, connectivity, renewable energy, future development, street design, challenges of the future. We have a deep bench of talented adults waiting for an opportunity to lead. We're ready. We need new blood. And I'm Matt Howland and I'm asking you to give me a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Sherwin Henry, your statement, please. Thank you. Let me start by saying, first of all, um, having experience is not a bad thing. I know in this day of, uh, in, in this day of internet and texting and so forth, that newness seems to sometimes uh, put experience to the side. But with experience comes dedication, commitment, and wisdom. Wisdom that can be used at this moment. For over 25 years, I've served our community with that dedication and commitment. And you might ask, why should I vote for you? How will you be different if you're elected to the Gainesville City Commission? Well, let me say this. First of all, my decision-making process comes from a greatly different set of life experience and thought processes than the current commissioners that are serving now. And I will be a steady and thoughtful voice of experience as your next commissioner. I understand that I serve the citizens of Gainesville and not them serving me. And I, again, would be honored for your vote for me on November 16th to become your at-large seat B Gainesville City Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. And Cynthia Chestnut, your statement, please. See, Ms. Chestnut? There. Thank Sorry. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the difficulty was in getting the video back. Thank you for the opportunity. Please return me to the city commission to work together to build a better Gainesville, to address my priorities, neighborhood preservation, violence prevention and eradication, environmental protection and energy justice. I want to thank the Democratic Women's Clubs of Florida, the Transit Workers, CWA, the Human Rights Council of North Central Florida, and the Stonewall Democrats for their endorsement. I have the experience and will be job ready day one to move forward, to work on behalf of the citizens, to be the voice in City Hall where citizens are welcomed. Vote for a seasoned candidate with proven experience on November 16th. Vote for Cynthia Chesta. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the candidates for attending the forum and for your thoughtful responses to our questions. This does end the panel for the Gainesville City Commission at large CB. I have a few final announcements. I'd like to give a very special thank you to those league members who volunteered to serve in various roles and to attend our practices. This forum would not have been possible without your participation and your volunteering spirit. Now we will move on to the final election reminders. Election day is Tuesday, November 16th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at your assigned precinct. Please vote. Early voting is Friday, November 12th through Sunday, November 14th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Mill Hopper Branch Library and at the Alachua County Supervisor of Elections Office. The deadline to register to vote in this election is over. It was on October 18th. Residents of the city of Gainesville may vote at either location during early voting. If you would like to vote by mail, request that ballot by 5 p.m. on November 6th. It must be received in the Alachua County Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on election day. Again, that's Tuesday, November 16th. And the drop boxes for mail ballots will be available at Millhopper Branch Library and the Alachua County Supervisor of Elections Office during the early voting hours. 
The Supervisor of Elections Office will have an additional Dropbox hour on Monday, November 15th from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now you can verify your voter status and your address, as well as check the status of your mail-in ballot if you will go to the www.votalachua.com. That is the Supervisor of Elections website, and it's under My Registration Status. Just read along, follow the directions. Make sure you vote was, your vote was received and you can follow up after the election to make sure it was received. If you prefer to do this by phone, the number is 352-374-5252. Hello. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's forum. Please keep an eye on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page for the recordings to show. Have a wonderful weekend.